Annoying. Mr. Lanza, what will your pleasure be? Let me take your order, jot it down. You ain't never had a friend like me. Wow. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. All of our dogs are adoptable. Except that one. I'm an ogre. You know, grab your torch and pitchforks. Doesn't that bother you? Man, I like you. What's your name? Uh, Trek. Shrek! It might be a good idea for you to disappear from Casablanca for a while. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. After you, Junior. Yes, sir. Ah! <laughs> Some great movies in there. You have Buzz and Woody, you've got uh, the, the crew from The Wizard of Oz, you've got the Avengers, people who you wouldn't necessarily put together. And I was thinking, you know, we could be in there too. We could be. Yeah, tall, short, old, young. Smart, not so. Uh, you know, um, hmm, Midwest, West Coast. Yeah, you know, there's lots of things that could be in there. Yeah, could yeah, be. yeah. Uh -huh. But you know, what's really cool about that video is that it's full of friendships where people didn't necessarily have a lot in common, but they came together because of something bigger than themselves. You know, I could identify with one of those. Perhaps everybody in here uh, was a superhero for Halloween when they were a kid. You all have your favorite superhero, and maybe you grew out of that when you got older, and maybe, you know, you didn't grow out of it all the way. You know, still have a little Superman yeah, going on. Yeah, 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 because that was what you dressed up for Halloween, right? When I was a little kid, that's right. Yeah, see, Cape uh, and all. My thing wasn't so much superheroes, it was The Wizard of Oz. And I know that, like, I say I liked The Wizard of Oz, but I, I think that I need to show some photos to just prove it. So this is my fifth grade birthday party. Invite all your friends over and make them put on costumes. That's a good way to make some friends. Uh, this is in high school. I dressed up as Dorothy for Halloween, and then we actually ended up doing The Wizard of Oz at my high school, and I was a part of that show as well. You clearly went way beyond the movie. Uh, yeah, big fan. Big fan of The Wizard of Oz. Okay. I love all those random people coming together for a common theme. Believe it or not, that feeds right into the story that we're going to look at in the book of Acts today with the church in Philippi. Three very unrelated characters that come together to form this church that ends up transforming the entire city. And that's what happens when three, when people come together with a power greater than themselves for a mission greater than themselves. That's right. And the way that this church got its dramatic start is going to be familiar to all of you kids who are at Vacation Bible School this week. Think back to Tuesday when you went to Paul's adventures and he told you when he and Silas were in prison. Maybe this picture will spark your memory, that's what, remember you guys got put in handcuffs just like Paul and Silas did. Well, this story begins actually not in Athens, where we were this week at VBS, but about 200 miles to the north in a city called Philippi. And it's there where an unlikely collection of people start a church. Their differences couldn't be greater. They're not, there's not a whole lot in common between them, but they do have this one thing in common, a faith in Jesus. And because of that, that brings us to today's main point, Jesus 
is all that matters. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 16, we'll be in verse 11. If not, there's a blue Bible that should be below you or in front of you, and grab that and turn to page 1096. That's where we'll be reading, you can follow along. But as you're turning there, Chelsea already introduced us a little bit to Philippi. Here, this is a lot of important stuff going on there. Philippi is a Roman colony. Uh, so Roman military veterans, veterans of the Roman army are there. They were given incentive to settle there because Rome wanted more of its people in that part of the empire. That's one important piece. It's not a large city compared to, say, Ephesus or Athens or Corinth, other places that Paul founded churches, but it's the very first church ever in the continent of Europe. Here's how it goes, beginning in verse 11. From Troas... We put out to sea and sailed straight through for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city in the district of Macedonia, and we stayed there for several days. That's right. So our story actually begins on the Sabbath. Let's pick it up at verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So Paul and his fellow church planters decide to take a walk down to the river just outside the city gates at Philippi. Now this may seem strange, why wouldn't they go to a synagogue? Well, in order for a city to have a synagogue back then, they had to have at least 10 married Jewish men in the town. And Philippi just doesn't make the cut, there's not enough people. So instead, Paul and Silas and his other church planters know that if they go down to the river, they'll find people gathered there to pray. Now, the people who are gathered there to pray are people who believe in the one true God, but don't yet know about the saving power of his son, Jesus. So upon arriving at the riverbank, Paul and Silas find what they expect, a group of people who are gathered. It's largely women, and they share the good news with these women. One of them is a woman named Lydia from Thyatira. Now, anybody in the time that this was written would have recognized the name Thyatira and affiliated it with purple cloth. Thyatira was known for manufacturing purple textiles. Now, creating purple fabrics back then was no easy task. Some say it took 10,000 crushed shellfish to yield one gram of purple dye. That's one paper clip's worth of purple dye. So it was a very long process to create these purple fabrics. As such, purple fabrics cost a lot of money, so Lydia, as a dealer in purple fabrics, would have had a lot of status and power. But as we see, upon hearing the good news, Lydia is willing to put all that status and power into God's hands. The passage says the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So now, for Lydia, Jesus is all that matters. So we got a rich lady, business lady, mm -hmm. who's found Christ essentially at a Bible study. Yes, at a okay. Bible study. All right. Now, Lydia is the first of the three founding members of the church in Philippi, but as we'll see, the next person that joins experiences a dramatic heart change like Lydia did, but in a much more dramatic Very way Very different general. lady. Yes. So let's start at verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her at that moment, the spirit left her. Now, Pastor Jim, I think it's important that we clarify, if we came across somebody who said that they were telling us the future, we would think they were bananas, right? We would probably ignore them and walk the other direction. But, but this, this lady is, had credibility. This lady had a lot of credibility. Mm -hmm. In fact, people were so engrossed with the idea of this spirit, this python spirit. It was a mythical snake, basically, that was worshiped at a really famous temple in Delphi. So the people would go and they would hear the, per the, um, 
the slave girl would come and she would start doing these utterances. So if you're possessed by this evil spirit, you start to speak in a language that nobody can understand but the priest. And the priest conveniently translate that for you, and then the slave girl's owners charge you money to find out what the translation says. Yeah, they made big said. bucks off of that's her. That's right, that's yeah. right. So even the demon, though, inside of this slave girl knows the saving message of the power of Jesus. And so it can't keep quiet. So it causes the slave girl to shout out constantly to Paul and to all of his friends that this is the people that are going to save, they have a saving message. These people follow Jesus. Well, Paul starts to get super annoyed, right? Because this girl is doing this every single day, and she's making such a scene that her spectacle in and of itself is becoming more important than the actual important thing, which is the gospel message. And so Paul, becoming increasingly frustrated, finally casts out the spirit in this girl. He does it because he has a heart of compassion, first of all, for this young woman that is possessed by this evil spirit. He does it because he can't stand the impure praise from the demon. And he does it because it's getting on his nerves, right? Yeah, no speaker likes to be interrupted. No, nobody likes Way worse than a cell phone. Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. And so he casts the demon out of this girl by the power of Jesus Christ. And so now the slave girl can accept Jesus of her own accord. And for her, Jesus is all that matters. I think it's important not to miss the distinction between these two ladies. you got one who's rich, another who's poor, another who's a person of high standing, another who's a person who's abused, is on the margins. We've got somebody who's very moral, uh, like Lydia, and essentially is attending prayer meetings, another one that's being channeling evil spirits. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who was essentially saved, at a prayer meeting Bible study, right? And another person that was saved by a dramatic power encounter when she's delivered from an evil spirit. Lydia sees Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. Uh, the slave girl meets Jesus as her deliverer, her transformer. There's, there could be nothing in common about these two people, absolutely nothing, except that they both encounter Jesus. And Jesus is all that matters. That's right. But unfortunately, not everyone is thrilled with these dramatic conversions, particularly with the slave girl. Let's pick up at verse 19. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. So the slave girl's owners are mad. They're mad because their source of income suddenly is gone. If she can't, if she can't predict the future, they don't get the money from those translations. And so there's no payout for them. So they think, we've got to punish these guys that have taken away our money. And the only way that they can think of to do that is to take them to the authorities. So they accuse Paul and Silas of throwing the city into an uproar because of their newfangled Jesus ideas. And as they take them uh, towards the city officials, what happens is that idea of mob mentality that I shared about a few Sundays ago. That idea that when a bunch of people are together and it's highly emotional, all of a sudden our rationality goes out the window. And so all these people are like, oh, mob, and they join in and they take Paul and Silas to the magistrates, the officials, and they order that Paul and Silas be stripped and beaten with rods. Now, Jim, that's a detail I don't want us to miss. Paul and Silas aren't just taken somewhere private and beaten up. They are taken to the middle of the marketplace. The marketplace like we had at Vacation Bible School this last week, kids. They are taken to the middle of the marketplace, stripped completely naked, and beaten. And they've not even done anything wrong. And on top of this public humiliation, now they're getting thrown into jail. And so they are, I mean, things just aren't looking great for Paul and Silas. And yet, their story is still unfolding. Yeah. So now let's introduce the third very unlikely character that Jesus is going to touch. It's a jailer. Here's what it says, beginning in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. 
And when he saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? We'll get back to that in a minute. They replied, believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and all your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because they had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. So when you think of a jailer like we would think, it's sort of like a prison guard's a lot like a cop. Right. They wear a uniform, they go to the prison, they make sure everybody stays where they're supposed to, they, they work so, a shift, they get fed, they go this, mm -hmm. they go that. The prison guard goes home, no big deal, end Same of the day. Thing every day. But this guy is different. He's a Roman army uh, soldier, most likely. And he's going to prefer, pre uh, prefer death to dishonor, right? So when he sees that the prison he thinks is free, he'd rather kill himself than be dishonored for mm -hmm. losing his prisoners. Right. But not only that, he's not a nice guy. Uh, he's all kinds of things that tell us that he's not a nice guy. He probably knows about the miracle. That thing would have gotten out. He probably also knows, definitely, that they were beaten publicly. That's how they were brought to him. So he knows that they've already been shamed. But he adds his own little bit of injustice and cruelty to it. He's the one that puts him in the stocks. He's the one that adds a little bit to it like this. Mm -hmm. So this is not a nice guy. And probably like every prisoner that they've ever seen, you know, if he hurts them, they would like to hurt him back. Right. He curses them, they curse him. You know, he's used to that give and take, but this is not any ordinary set of prisoners. Paul and Silas don't do anything like that. Instead, what do Paul and Silas do? They've been beaten, they're in the stocks, they're, they're, they're singing songs of praise. They're, they're praying, they're uttering scripture. And everybody in the prison sees it, hears yep. it, he does too. That had to be like, whoa, what is going on here? Peculiar. And he, and he clues in on that. Now, he's been cruel to them. They're being kind to him. He put their life more in danger. They save his life by making sure that all the prisoners stay put. And so he rushes to them. Hey, what do I got to do to be saved? What's it, what's it take is essentially the question, right? And, and they say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that seems very simple, but that word believe, we get hung up on a lot, all the time. Because it's easy to have sort of a generic kind of belief, right? A generic kind of belief that says sort of, well, okay, I believe in black holes, and I believe in Bigfoot, and Loch Ness Monster, and aliens, okay? I believe in that. Whether or not it happens or is true really makes no difference in my life. It's sort of a trivial thing. I believe or I don't believe. And it makes no difference... Uh, in terms of how I handle my time or my money or who I, how I talk to people, my life's not centered around that. It's just a trivial thing, right? We have all kinds of beliefs like that. And if that's the, uh, the limit of our belief in Jesus, that's not saving kind of belief, okay? It's like saying, oh, I believe in Jesus, but I really find the things of God boring. I, I don't want to engage in Scripture. I, I don't pray. I don't uh, want to be with God's people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make, it's not something I, I want to I serve. I only go to church if it's convenient with the schedule. That yeah, kind of all of that. Yeah. If that's the center, if that's, if that's what's really going on in your mm -hmm. heart, the chances are that's generic belief. That's not real belief in Jesus. That's not what makes us white with God. Mm -hmm. There's saving belief is very different. Here, here's just some examples of saving kind of belief. If I think that there's a glass of poison here, I'm not going to drink it because I believe it will hurt me. If I think that there's a fire in the door behind me, I'm not going in there, I'll get burned. Right. If I think that the bank is trustworthy, I'll give them my money in a deposit, right? If I believe that my wife loves me, I'll trust her with, mm -hmm. with, with my heart. All of those things, that, that's something I believe and therefore I act upon it, it changes my life. If you believe in Jesus with saving belief, your whole life is centered around him. It's not just some belief in a theory. It changes everything about you. You believe, for example, in his death. You believe historically he died on a cross, and that death was no ordinary historical event, but yet it paid the price for our sins once and for all, that Jesus did that to make us right with God. Not only that, you believe that he rose from the dead three days later. 
Again, not just some religious myth or some interesting theory or trivia. You believe that he rose from the dead, and because of that, everything he made, every claim he made in all of his teachings are true. I mean, if he rose from the dead, he has to be true, right? Now, if that's the case, that kind of belief changes your whole life. Everything is centered on that. It changes the way you think, the way you speak, the way you act. Your whole heart is shaped by that. And when that happens, you die to sin. You die to yourself. Yeah. Dying to sin is about repentance, right? There's things in my life that are not pleasing with God, and I want them out that I might live pleasing to Jesus. The jailer did that. Right. Paul did that too. Paul did that too. Yeah. When the jailer uh, began to repent, he notice what he does. He cleans up the wounds of, yep. of Paul and Silas. He gives them food. He's, he's very attentive to what yeah. they have to say. Paul was a man who was far from God, as you know in VBS, and then becomes a Christian and begins serving him, even suffers for him, like going to jail like this, right? right? That's a thing. You, you die to that, and you die to yourself too because you want to please God. In my life, there have been things that God has changed over time. He's dealt with pride, he's dealt with envy, he's dealt with greed and selfishness, and he still deals with stuff like that. And when that's there, I want to be removed from that, right? So you're dying to things and you're living to things. You want to live for Christ to please him. Right. You want to honor him. Now, that jailer, we know that he at least did some care for Paul and Silas, but sometimes I'm, I'm sure there was thousands of other things that he did that changed. There certainly were things that we know that changed in Paul's life that some are written in the scripture, some are not. There have been things that have changed in my life. In the jailer's life, he stood publicly and was baptized. I stood publicly as a teenager and was baptized. And since that time, God has continually been reworking and making me new. That's what happens. That's the difference between sort of a generic belief that doesn't really mean much and a saving belief that changes your life. Mm -hmm. And that can happen to a six-year-old and a 60-year-old. That's right. It can happen to somebody who's been in church all their life and walked in for the very first time. It can happen to somebody who's out on a park bench or sitting reading their Bible at home. God can do that with anything. And Jesus is all that matters. That's what happens. That's right. And when we really believe that Jesus is all that matters, then we see his power at work in our lives. We learn to recognize it. And so when we look at this unlikely cast of characters from today's story, we can see the places where Jesus' power displays itself, albeit in a bunch of different ways. So first up, there's the slave girl. That's a very clear display of Jesus' power. The slave girl shows us that Jesus has power over spiritual darkness. This is a woman who is possessed by a demonic spirit. But by the power of Jesus, Paul is able to cast it out of her. The light of Christ shines over this woman's spiritual darkness then, and the light of Christ shines over spiritual darkness now. Christ still has power over spiritual darkness yeah. today. That's important for us to remember. And then we look at Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas, they show us that Jesus has power over hard times, and that's a message a lot of us need to be reminded of on a regular basis. They're prisoners who are innocent of any crime, and yet here they are, thrown in jail. But it's interesting to think about this. Think about how these guys followed God's lead, right? They did what God asked them to do. They should have got a get out of jail free you card. You would think, you would think, but they still end up in prison. I think all too often we buy into this lie that if we follow Jesus, life's going to be easier. Things are going to just go our way. It's going to be sunshine and rainbows, but that's a lie, right? That's not true. When we follow Jesus, life is still going to be hard. We're still going to encounter difficulty. Like Jim said, it's no get out of jail free card. But when hard times come, we know that Jesus has power over them. We know that Jesus is still good. And because we know that Jesus is good and that he is in control, we can trust in his timing. We can trust in whatever the outcome is, recognizing that, all right, maybe things don't go our way, but God's still in control. Or maybe he's going to take us home to be with him. And so regardless of what happens, we can trust Jesus to have power over those hard times. Mm -hmm. Then we have the jailer. The jailer shows us that Jesus has the power to save. Jesus always, anytime, any place, under any circumstances, has the power to save. And what is he saving us from? He's saving us from our sinful selves. This past week at Bible school on Thursday night, this is a really cool visual. Up here, the kids wrote their names on the front of these hands, but on the back, they wrote sins that they deal with. 
And they laid them on the cross because they recognized the saving power of Jesus Christ. And so that's a reminder for us adults in the room, too, that Jesus has the power to save us. It doesn't matter what our past looks like. It doesn't matter what our uncertainty about the future is. Jesus always has the power to save. It's like Pastor Kenneth said last week, Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Jesus and Jesus only has that power to save. And finally, there's Lydia, that wealthy businesswoman from the beginning of our passage. And Lydia shows us that Jesus has the power to change hearts. Lydia's life was transformed when she surrendered to Jesus. And the fruit of that is seen immediately. She becomes exceedingly hospitable, inviting these early church members into her home. And then on top of that, she provides financially for Paul and Silas. And it's interesting because we actually have a follow-up on Lydia and these other members of that new church in Philippi in one of Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians. We received this update that Lydia and that church is known for being exceedingly generous despite severe trial and extreme poverty. Now that sounds funny because if we remember from the beginning, Lydia was very wealthy. Well, it seems she sacrificed all of that for the sake of the gospel. And Paul writes that she and the other followers, despite these trials, despite this hardship, they have an overflowing joy that propels them to generosity. So when we choose to follow Jesus, when we believe he's all that matters, our lives should look different as a result. We should be able to identify the places where Jesus' power is at work. That means that we're constantly changing. Like you talked about earlier, Pastor Jim, we're constantly evaluating those sins that we wrestle with and wondering what it would look like for us to change and grow to be more like God. On your bulletins, adults, there's a question for you this morning that I would challenge you to give some serious thought to this week. If Jesus is really all that matters, then where is Jesus' power on display in my life? Chelsea, if, if, if I had to think of where I fit with mm-hmm. one of these characters, and I think you probably said the same thing in our conversations, we, we're a lot like Lydia, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, grew up in the church, not really a, a lot of crazy rebellion in our life, and yet we found Christ. I, as a teenager, you as a young person too, and uh, since that time, the Holy Spirit enters our life, mm-hmm. and we actually, uh, have, he changes us yeah. more and more every day. And it really is about Jesus. Jesus is all that matters in an encounter like that. But this church... And no church is made up of just a bunch of Lydia's. Right. There are some Lydia's in here, but not, bu- not all Lydia's. There are slave girls here. There are people in our congregation, uh, some you know, maybe some you don't, who once were caught up in a lot of evil and darkness. And the only reason that they're not still caught up in evil and darkness today is by the power of Jesus Christ. They encountered him and he transformed their life. And in a powerful way, they're a testament to his his miraculous work. And Jesus is all that matters. And there's jailers here, too. People who were indifferent to spiritual things, who were just going about their business. You know, they're going to work 40 hours a week, punching the clock, going home, going through their routine day in and day out. And Jesus wasn't even on the radar. And then they saw an example of him. Maybe it was a co-worker, a friend, family, and member, and they saw hope and they saw peace and they saw joy and they saw love and they saw graciousness and a sense of purpose or maybe that they they never saw before and they they knew it was not something that they had but it was something that they needed and wanted and they they saw Jesus in that person and they were drawn to them and there was a transformation there and it was an encounter with Jesus and Jesus is all that matters maybe there's a Paul and Silas here right there feel like you're going through and doing good things, you're doing what God wants you to do, and yet here you're put in the jail cell, right? And you're, you're hurting. And, and you need another encounter with Jesus too, where he's with you no matter what, and you know he's there no matter what. But we have that too. What matters is Jesus. What happens is when we encounter him, our lives are transformed. So, like Chelsea asked you a minute ago, What's the place where his power is showing up in your life? Are you saying yes to him? The most important and pivotal question of your life. We're going to remember today as we close in this service that Jesus' body was given for us and his blood was shed for us. It's the most pivotal thing he could ever do. And the scriptures say that we as Christians and we take this body and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so as we sing this closing song, if you are part of 
Christ's family, if you've had an encounter with him, you have that saving belief, I invite you to come and take a bit of juice and a bit of bread, go back to your seat and thank him for who he is and for what he has done. If you don't know him yet, then I hope you'll join me in a prayer in just a few moments and you can come to know him. Would you stand with me as we pray? Lord Jesus, right now we pray that the eyes of our heart would be opened that our minds would be clear, that our ears would hear the things that you want to say to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We confess today that apart from you, we've sinned and we've been separated and our lives are not what you want and we don't know you, but we want to. Mm -hmm. We want to know you. We want to have your Holy Spirit come and live inside our hearts. We want our lives to be transformed by you whether we're a Lydia, whether we're a jailer, whether we're a slave girl, we want to be transformed by you forever. We pray, God, that you would forgive our sins, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would come and live inside us and make us new forever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.